This is Talking Drupal, a weekly chat about web design and development by a group of guys with one thing in common. We love Drupal. Visit us at TalkingDrupal.com. We record this show Wednesday afternoons at a Google Hangout. This is episode 57, July 30th, 2014. HTML emails. Wow, that sounds like such a this sounds like such an ugly topic. <laughs> it it can be because we we are going to have to get back in our time machine at some point and go back to the mid '90s and and code in tables again. So brace yourself, brace yourself, viewers, it's coming. <laughs> exactly. So welcome everyone to episode fifty-seven. Uh, we have with us, as usual, Jason Pamental from HW Design. What says you, Jason? I uh, says happy summer and looking forward to lots more Drupal fun this weekend at the 4D in Boston. Yeah, designed for Drupal. You know, I saw a tweet uh, yesterday by someone, don't remember who it was, that said like, oh, wow, lots of stuff going on in New England in the next few months with Drupal. Uh, we've got designed for Drupal... Um, this weekend, we've got um, the nude summit coming. The nude, I mean the nerd summit, <laughs> coming up in September, I believe. We got the um, new the Connecticut Drupal camp coming up in August, the end of August, and we have the new New England Drupal camp coming up in November. So, it's a busy time for us here. Okay, buddy, hear me. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, all right, good. <laughs> um, so we also have John Pacozzi from Oomph. Hey, John. That is my last name and the company I'm from. Uh, I am also very excited about Design for Drupal. Um, it's going to be my first uh, my first time speaking at uh, a camp or, or something of that level, so I'm looking forward to that. John, when is your presentation? What time on Friday? It is at 11.30 on Friday. So oh, that's good. So I can heckle right, you. Right before lunch. You can come in and, and sit in and, and gain some, drift some knowledge from uh, myself and uh, our CTO, Dave McKinley, and then uh, you can go eat lunch. Awesome. We also have Nick Laughlin from Enlightened Design. I'm definitely getting pretty excited about D4D myself as well. Uh, also looking forward to some news coming out for the new camp website in the next probably two or three hours. Um, I'm not going to steal anybody's thunder, though. And uh, Oh, go ahead. Steal it, Nick. Well, registration should be opening uh, in the next few hours. You know, cross and, and a cross. bunch of site changes, too, I understand. Yep, fully newly designed home page. Uh, I think the sub pages have been tweaked as well. Should be more responsive. It's a, it's a whole new whole new site. If for some reason it doesn't happen, viewers, feel free to send hate mail to Nick's Van on Twitter. <laughs> and all the internets. <laughs> yes, I'll be looking for that if, it, if anything goes wrong. And I'd also like to uh, introduce uh, Stephen Cross, who's the uh, the main host here. Thank you, Nick. Um, <laughs> so let's get yeah, exactly. Thank you. Uh, let's get started on today's show. So we're going to talk about HTML email. Um, and, and our show notes are very full of comments today. I have to thank John for spending a little extra time today. And it saves a whole lot of time for me doing this in post, post by listening to the show back. So that's awesome. Um, let's, let's start this conversation by let's talking about how people use emails in a website and that seems like such a simple thing to talk about and it is uh, but it does make it does help you make decisions about what some of the tools are and strategies you use uh, to integrate HTML email into your website or any email um, and I, I always look at emails as sitting in two categories uh, maybe you guys have can offer some more insight into other groupings, but I really look at stuff as transactional or service emails, meaning that it's an email that comes out to one per one person based on some action they've taken in the website. That's often like uh, maybe a reset my password, 
Um, they've just registered for the website. Uh, a shipping confirmation coming and uh, an invoice coming to them or some system notification. Um, I also then think of things as bulk emails where they go to a group of people at one time. So right. some examples of that would be a newsletter that's coming out. Um, could be some marketing material. Uh, could be a forum that you subscribe to. So when anyone else posts a topic in a forum that you receive an email. Um, and the way these emails are sent out help you decide how you're going to handle it in the back of the system. Um, do you guys think about emails in any other ways other than those two major groups? Well, I mean, I add to that group, like organic groups. So that's something that we use quite a lot, and communication within those groups is really easy to facilitate and and is really... Uh, been very helpful. Yeah, sure. So those fit in my head in terms of bulk email. The reason yeah. why I separate these two things mm -hmm. is because of volume. Volume is such an important thing to think about when you're dealing with email. Um, it helps you decide what service you could be using to help you send the email. For example, um, Google has limits. So if, if you have a small customer, uh, or maybe it's a big customer, but they have a small user base, um, and they're using Google Apps to s as their email provider, you could be sending emails out directly through Google. That is a certainly a very legitimate way to send emails out. So it comes out through their domain. It's an info at whatever their company is, and that works great for low volume. If you start to get over two or 300 emails a day coming from that domain, you're going to have problems with Google. They're going to be shutting you down. So things like that are things you need to think about as you're sending out emails. And, and what is your strategy in terms of sending out emails that are more than two or 300 a day for things like a newsletter or a forum? You, you have to use a provider that's going to allow you to send those out in bulk. Steve, is that limit um, per account or per... Uh, let, me, let me refine that. Is it per email address or is it per account? Yeah, so... I found that, that that limit to be per email address. So, um, But Google is a little bit vague on their actual hard limits on these things. But I've found that it's been per email address. Um, but I, I don't think you want to put yourself in a position that you're doing info one, info two, info three to sort of work yeah. around those kind of <laughs> limits, right? But you, you'll see that same problem if you're sending emails from your own account. I mean, if you try to send 300 emails from your personal Gmail account right out of your inbox a day, you're going to have the same issue. It, it's not a fact that they're coming from a website or anything else. It's, it's what they try to do to keep the spam down. Yeah. Well, and, and I think um, one of the other kinds of email, like the bulk things, um, that will frequently run into issues like that are content notifications. So when we, uh, when when John and I worked together, um, we had a had built a website for CVS Caremark, and they would have upwards of 19 or 20 thousand people subscribe to get notifications when a press release got posted. So you know that would go out, and it was being sent directly from that web server. So we actually didn't have any issues with that going out. Um, but I honestly couldn't tell you. I mean, this was a number of years ago, and, and um, policies have certainly gotten stricter with different providers. So um, it could well be that, you know, since that was five years ago, that might not fly now without doing a little bit more work to provide verification of um, uh, the authenticity of the sender. Right, which, which is a major issue. So... Yeah. so how, how this actually relates, like this topic of these bulk emails, does it really relate directly to HTML emails? Uh, not necessarily, but I certainly wanted to bring it up as a point of things you should think about as we start to talk about some of the services that can you can use to send out emails as we get to that point. John, you wanted to say something there? Yeah, I was just going to add in, um, also your hosting provider uh, can be um, limiting your email sending. Um, uh, Jason had just mentioned that for CBS Caremark, we used uh, the server the site was hosted on. Um, 
But uh, more recently, um, we actually had a problem with uh, bulk emails going out um, through a Rackspace server, and Rackspace actually limiting the number of emails and doing some spam checking on their end before the email goes out um, to make sure that it's not considered spam or that it's going to get picked up by spam bots. Um, so that's another another thing to think about is, uh, you know, does it make sense to send it through your your web server um, depending on, and, and again, it comes back to volume really, I would imagine. You know, there's an interesting issue that we ran into that's slightly related to this. It wasn't the volume initially, but it's also the content. So uh, we're working with a hospital in Canada on a program for new mothers with breastfeeding. And what we found is that um, it's it's basically a, an intranet kind of system. We have to be a member to get this content, and it's forum-based. But we were finding that uh, periodically... Mothers with Gmail accounts and with some Yahoo accounts, the email was um, getting blocked sometimes coming from the website. It wasn't volume in those cases. It was content that at points when words like breast were being used and breastfeeding, um, the content was being flagged as inappropriate and not getting through to the mothers, which sounds so strange, but... Um, so we've been very careful about outbound emails from the website in terms of the language that's being used in the content because wow. that stuff will get blocked from Google as well. There is there's is also um, something going on between Google and um, at least between Google and Rackspace where Google is blocking some emails being sent from Rackspace servers. Um, that's another, uh, in conjunction with the, the previous issue that I was talking about, that's another thing that we found. Um, so Gmail Gmail can sometimes be the culprit as well. So, so let's talk a little bit about what do you get reg with regards to creating HTML emails as opposed to just static emails from Drupal, quote-unquote, out of the box. Did we confirm? I know we had a discussion about this earlier today. Did we actually confirm what you get? Can you send an HT, HTML email with some basic module installs? Um, uh, with modules, not not with core. Okay. Core well, Drupal well, is plain text email. Uh, what what are the what are the reasons that you'd want HTML email? Just we didn't ask this question up front, but I was just sort of thinking of it now, because plain text really alleviates a lot of issues for you. You enjoy what, what, are, what are the you reasons? Enjoy tables. <laughs> you enjoy yeah. coding with tables. Well, <laughs> line, it's, it's, yeah, but it's not just that. It's just having any amount of structure or format. So if you want to do a newsletter, it's really difficult to do that if you without um, having HTML email as possibility. It's also Really it's impossible. To, um, well, no, I'm not going to say it's impossible because I've gotten lots of really um, kind of hard-to-read newsletters in the past that simply use plain text and ASCII characters to um, to denote breaks between things. And um, okay. it, you know, you, you it, use the word structure, so I, I was trying right. to. If you need structure then you yeah. really need HTML emails. Well, and if you want to have it, uh, any amount of design to it. And, I mean, you know, if you want your email to stand out in any way and provide any real sense of clarity about the message, then you're likely going to need some color, some, you know, some type treatment, some imagery, a logo perhaps, and, and all of those things mean you need HTML email. So basically, what you're saying is, once you get the marketing team, once you get the marketing team involved, that's that's when you're going to need HTML. No, no. What I'm saying is, anytime you want to convey information with any amount of clarity, you need to have HTML email. That's, I, I mean, yeah. Marketing always complicates things, but design is not a function of marketing. Design is about communication, and and if you want to have good design in your email, then you need HTML email. So, so back back to the out of the box question. So, Drupal Core, 
we'll send out emails as sort of what I called servicing or transactional emails out of the box, and they're all text-based. Um, and by default, they come from the emails will come from your web server. Um, and if, you need to if your web server is configured to send emails. Right. Does Drupal know that though? Or doesn't it just try to send them anyway, even if your web server is not configured? Yeah, you would have to have knowledge of whether your web server is configured to to send emails, um, whether your uh, SMTP your server has an SMTP service available to you. Well, most most hosting does provide for that. So if you can install Drupal and set it to notify you when there are module updates and you receive that email, then you know Drupal is sending email. So, I mean, it's it's pretty quick to figure out if you can send anything at all. You uh, they, they, just do a password reset if you yeah, want to check. Yeah, I mean, yeah, and any of the things that would be sort of like normal triggers for sending a system message of some kind. So if, if you're mail server can't send email, or if you choose to do it from outside of your server, what are your options at that point? There are um, a bunch of services out there that you can use that will act as uh, SMTP server um, for you. Uh, you also, uh, I'm looking right now for the mod, there's a module where you can define in Drupal your own SMTP server that's external from your web server. Uh, it's called um, SMTP Authentication Support. Yeah. Oh, well, that's fabulous. Now we don't have to look it up. Uh, so there are third-party services out there that you can use, um, one of which uh, we've been looking at for a client of ours uh, is Mandrill, which is... Um, actually a, a service of MailChimp. Um, it's a, a different kind of their, their SMTP um, offering. Uh, and essentially it allows you to um, install a module into Drupal and then send email through their API to their servers and allow their servers to um, send out the emails um, for you. Um, some of you may be asking why. Why is that useful? Why is that helpful? You know, why wouldn't I just set it up on my own server? Um, takes a little bit of the load off of your server, but also it gives you um, some great analytics on um, your emails and if they're being sent, if they're being bounced, what's happening to them, who's opening them, if their links are being clicked on, that sort of thing. Um, you can also set up rules within uh, within Mandrill to allow um, for different actions depending on um, what kind of emails you're sending out. So if you have a couple of different emails that you're using, you can actually um, have them formatted differently or, or different from addresses. Um, and you can set that up directly through, uh, through Mandrill. So that's a pretty good solution for high volume, like we were mentioning earlier, because the cost is pretty reasonable. Yeah, they're free up to a certain point, and then they charge, and then they're pretty pretty reasonable um, from there on out. So Ma Mandrill's a great option, even for low volume. You know, it get so so the negative side of Mandrill would be that it's actually not coming from you directly, right? I'm not I'm not sure that's a negative or not. The positive, the positive side is that it is not coming from you directly. So a lot of MailChimp has done a lot of work in terms of not getting mail blocked. So you're getting the benefits of yeah. the work they do to make sure your mail is not marked as spam. And and I believe the number is, because we have one customer that's using Mandrill, I think the, the count is like 12,000 emails a month you can send yeah. out before yeah. you pay. I'm looking at it right now. It's free up to 12k, and then it's uh, 20 cents per thousand on uh, a million emails, um, and then it goes down from there depending on how much more volume you do. And you know, one of the things to keep in mind is, I mean, so many people use Google Apps, and if you want to send something that um, is from that domain and you end up trying to send it to someone at that domain, Google's going to block it 
because it's coming from a server that's not an authorized emailer for that domain. So uh, without doing a bunch of setup, like so, say like you know mycompany.com, I use Google Apps for my email, and I have a mailing list that's originating from my web server, and it's going to thousands of customers plus a bunch of employees. Now it's coming from info at mycompany.com, and when it goes to those hosted Gmail accounts for every of all my employees, Google's going to look at the originating sender of that message, and quite often it will end up blocking it. So unless you do take some extra steps to ensure that your email ser- that your web server is listed as a valid email sender in your DNS records, um, which is doable, but it's it's just another step that you have to take. Then, then Google's going to reject it as a non-authentic sender for that domain. And since, other... since we're talking about these kinds of issues, I think it's helpful to mention um, there's a website called mail-tester.com. Um, when you go there, it gives you a funky-looking email address, uh, and you have to have you have your server send an email to that address. I usually just put it in a web form and send a test web form. Then you can check the score, and it will tell you, like, for example, um, you don't have the SPF record set up correctly. You don't have the DKIM, you know, settings correct. It, and it will score you out of 10, you know, whether or not it should be spam. And it's, I, I, I don't know if you guys have experienced this, but I've found that um, spam rules have gotten much, much stricter over the last six months. I found many, 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 many things that, used to just go through fine that weren't spam, now getting marked as spam. Um, not just for my clients, but in general. Um, the other the other nice thing about Mandrill along that same line is they actually have spam filter testing. So you can, once you get your email set up um, or your account set up, you can actually do a spam filter test to see, um, you know, what filters may block you and what they're going to block you for. And, and you can correct it before you start sending out emails. That's a nice tool. Yeah, because once you get marked, it's very, very difficult to undo that sometimes. So one thing I just wanted to mention, so Jason brought up the, if you're a Gmail or a G- Gmail apps user, um, you'll have issues with being authenticated as someone to email on behalf of that domain. Um, that that's the option that you then have to use that module SMTP authentication support, where you actually yeah. send them mail directly from Google. Right. The then the issue you run into is then you have the limits per day. Right. Is is your issue on that side? Um, so so in terms of uh, modules for outbound email or strategies for outbound email, and yet we haven't even talked about HTML yet emails. <laughs> Um, uh, John, you mentioned Mandrill. Are there any other uh, modules or services for outbound email that uh, we want to talk about? Well, I think the, I think you start then getting into what are the other modules you can add to give you different um, levels of formatting. So, and and actually, before we go off of Mandrill, I want to mention one thing. Only only I don't see it in the list here, and it's something that I'm aware of. Um, you can use Mandrill and just plug it in, and all your emails that are coming out of Drupal will just go to it as they're formatted. I believe you also have the option to create templates on the Mandrill side for the formatting of the HTML email, and then as your emails go out, you say, I want to use this template. And so you manage your the structure and layout of your emails on the Mandrill slash MailChimp side, and then from the Drupal side, you're just managing the content that you're pushing to those templates. Huh. I wonder yeah, if that, that, is, that. that is correct, Steve. You have the ability to mm-hmm. use um, MailChimp's um, templating engine to create your templates. And then using what I had talked about with rules there, you can actually set you know, what email uh, template you use when the, mail, the message goes out. So you could essentially have Drupal just send a plain text email, and then you could have Mandrill give it the um, HTML uh, that, it, that it needs in order to be an HTML email. So, now, does it, does it reduce load in your server? Because I know you had mentioned the CVS notification. Sending out 19, 20, 30,000 emails 
can put a decent amount of load on the server. But if you're sending this information over to Mandrill first, there's still going to be some load there, I would say, because it, there there is going to be an API call for man to from your site to Mandrill with uh, you know with some kind of information. So. I would say that there is going to be some sort of some sort of performance hit, but I, I don't know if it's as bad as sending, you know, uh, twelve thousand HTML emails directly from your web server. You got to keep in mind that that Mandrill falls into the groups I gave at the beginning of this conversation. It's a transactional email, so if you're going to send it to twelve thousand people, you're having twelve thousand calls to Mandrill. Yeah. So it is a single SMTP call per. Uh, per email that goes out, and unless you're doing something in a CC or creating a, a user list on your side, you're not doing like you would do in Mailchimp itself, which says, "Hey, send it to this list of people." Right. It's a single transactional email. Well, and that and that is worth bringing up because you you could, in theory, then have all the addresses in a BCC field, and be sending what is effectively a single message. That will then be resent to all those people, but that's that tends to be one of the things that will raise your spam score on the message. So exactly, right. having messages be individually addressed and personalized is one of the ways to cut down on the likelihood of it being considered spam. So then, what's the savings there if you're doing the SMTP call locally versus Mailchimp? Is it just that they've done so much work to make sure it doesn't get marked as spam? There's the spam side of it, and then also the uh, analytical side of it. So you're, you, you know, Mandrill's giving you again. They're giving you that ability to check the links and see who's clicking on what, and see kind of who, you know, whose email is bouncing and that sort of thing. So it's giving you a little bit more than if you were to just send it through through Drupal through your SMTP server. So the advantage for, for my use of this, Nick, was because the customer has Google Apps that I use this for. So they were they have a forum, and they were bumping up against the 300 emails a day. So the choice at that point was to get another email provider that could just send the email or use something like Mandrill. So it was an obvious choice for the reasons John gave, but also it was, it was a great option for them at the 12,000 email threshold per month, which is basically 400 a day, which they've clearly stayed under in the last four months. So um, it's a good solution just for a general SMTP solution okay. for somebody. Okay, so let's, let's move on here. So if you're going to now create, you want to create some HTML emails from within Drupal, what are some of the modules you guys have used to do that in the past? One of them is Simple News. Well, but but first off, it's MindMail. Sure. Okay. Because MindMail is the one that actually adds the support for HTML email and attachments and inline styles. That will actually, you, you can basically, with a click of a box or two, just have it send all your email through the MindMail module sender, and it will... Um, allow you to embed your basic site styles and then um, send everything formatted as HTML email. So you can use that as basically a replacement for the default sending mechanism um, and that gives you the ability to format messages and lots of templating options with tokens and all sorts of things to structure um, the messages that go out um, using that sending method. Yeah, it's really it's really nice because as Jason said, it pulls in the, the theme styles that you currently have, uh, whatever your enabled theme is. Um, so it kind of saves you it saves you a little bit of a step there, um, but uh, it also allows for attachments. Um, so where I've used this this feature in the past is if you're ha you have uh, you know um, job postings on your website and you need to you want to get the resume as an attachment in an email. You can you can set my mail to send those attachments along with the email. Um, I, I wouldn't recommend that on a on a bulk some sort of bulk email um, operation, but on the kind of transactional stuff, I think the, you know having the attachments right there is very useful. Well, but even in uh, the scenario that I had described with press releases, if you wanted to include the press release as an attachment, it's something that you you can do. Um, I, I mean. 
whether or not that's a good idea, it does give you the ability to, to set it up and structure it to do so. So I haven't used my mail all that much. So tell me about the structure of the templates that it, it's using a style, but the styles, you know, CSS is not a smart way to create an HTML email. So w what is my mail doing? Does anyone know in terms of creating styles that are embedded in an HTML email? It, Do you know? It converts it all to inline styles. It does, okay. Yeah, so so it actually does a relatively good job. Now, the, the formatting of individual components of messages I was mixing up with notifications, um, that's a whole, that's another module worth talking about, but... Um, but it allows you to basically say, do you want to include these styles or not, or do you want to include this style sheet? And it embeds it all as an inline chunk of styles rather than a linked style sheet. Hmm. I'm curious to know, this is a, sort of a general question, is have you guys seen customers that have been uh, really pressing for HTML formatted emails, or do you generally find that customers... Are, are happy to get an email out of their systems and are not paying all that much attention to how exactly they look. I just spent um, quite a bit of time with one of our clients working on on their HTML emails and and making sure that the posts that they were posting were emailing out with a image and a link back and and you know a header image and all that stuff. So. I would say that a lot of people are very, very interested in um, the HTML emails if their website is doing a lot of interaction with their users. Um, a lot of people, on the flip side of that, a lot of people that are, you know, their website is not doing a lot of interaction with their users, and, and they're, they're perfectly fine just getting the plain text emails from the system that say, oh, hey, there's an update, or, oh, hey, somebody submitted a web form, and here are the values. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's really, it really depends on what the, uh, the goal of the website is. Well, I think you actually mentioned one there that um, can, can really benefit from using HTML instead of the default output, and that is actually web form results, because when web form results get mm -hmm. sent, Interesting. It's, yeah. it's label and value... In, on you know one one right after the other on a row and then it just sort of breaks down to the next line with each one and that can actually end up being really hard to read if you have a lot of information in the form so instead actually creating a template that will allow it to be um, formatted in a table of some way um, actually would make that stuff a lot more useful and usable for the people receiving that email now they also have the option to go back and look at that online or download the results in a CSV, but oftentimes what people want is an email that's well-structured that they can just either print and use or or look at and, and know the information they need to know, like um, information requests or uh, order receipts. Like and There's a bunch of things that um, kind of benefit from from having that level of structure. And, and actually, in support of e-commerce, those tend to really want to have that HTML email structure um, in order to send a receipt that actually is legible to people. Yeah, I would say my clients um, generally don't worry about it too much unless it's a newsletter. Um, and then if they're using a newsletter, they're either using Constant Contact or MailChimp generally, uh, which, which allows you to handle that. Um, there's, I've had a couple clients where I've had to look into it, but it, it's never been, it's usually me that's the driving force um, behind that. We've had a lot of clients that uh, we've done newsletters for, and that's been an absolute requirement for us to be able to set up a well-formatted designed email that matches the, the site style and has that you know sort of typical newsletter two-column kind of thing with links to the articles and, and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, we have, we have a couple of customers that our primary function for them is to create HTML emails. So, and uh, I actually am the person that creates the physical HTML file. 
and we hand it off to an agency that sends about you know two million emails a month. Uh, so it's it's really interesting to get a feel for what the content needs to be structured like inside of an HTML file, as opposed to and testing it in all the environments like like Yahoo email in an Internet Explorer browser, IE8. You know. When you have requirements that say my HTML email needs to be viewed in every browser and most platforms, you have some challenges. It's like it's almost like going back to this has nothing to do with email. It's really more about HTML and you know structuring this page to work in browsers, browser-based sure. tools, and it's it's fascinating, challenging, and um, so uh, kind of how long, can we, can how we do a uh, can we do a crossfade there on the screen? Because I think you just jumped into that time machine I was talking about. Yeah. Did I do that? Yeah. <laughs> Go, going back in time there to the table-based the table based layout. Uh, and it's funny because I have one due today. <laughs> it's it's due by 5 o'clock. And it's, it's really going back to dealing with tables. And it's so funny because probably most of us, or maybe not Nick on this phone call, are really comfortable putting layouts together in tables. <laughs> I mean, moving to CSS True. was a challenge. I, w I actually wonder what it's like for someone who's never dealt with tables to go back to it uh, when they grew up with CSS. Uh, it's a whole different language. The term but, uh, hell, hell on earth comes to mind. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, I want to make I want to make mention of, of resources that we'll have in the show notes. Um, both Campaign Monitor and MailChimp, two really excellent um, services similar to Constant Contact to allow you to send out bulk email has um, have great articles on creating responsive emails, but mm -hmm. along with that are really useful templates in order to um, create those emails in the first place. So they actually make a really good code starting point for creating your own templates for the emails that you're going to be sending because um, the modules do allow for um, custom template files. So like Simple News allows you to create um, a couple different template files that are just for the sending of mail. So if you want to have um, something that's a pretty good starting point, um, those articles have good sample code for you to start working with. And it's an extra bonus because it'll work well on mobile devices too. So we've, we've sort of gone off the track here a little bit in terms of our agenda, but you 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 mentioned responsive HTML emails. So let's just talk about that for a second and think about what that means. So what we're saying is that someone receives an email um, that's promoting something from a company, and what are the chances of them seeing it on their mobile phone? Well, they're extremely <laughs> high. Yeah, like. No like close to 90% of all emails are opened on mobile phones, so it's really, really high. So if you're thinking about, you know, doing some email campaigns or sending newsletters or something, and you're not thinking about the responsive look of that, you're probably starting in the wrong place. Yeah. <laughs> yep. So it, what it means is writing code... Right for an HTML email that would work in a modern browser um, and would be responsive, and we all know what responsive sites are, so it's responsive HTML in an email, but also will work uh, on an older system, which would be maybe like a, that description I had, which was someone who's still using Yahoo in a browser. Um, or someone who's using Outlook because Outlook switched oh. to the rendering engine from Microsoft Word instead of the one from their very capable web browser. Right. And and that's that's something that has been in place for a couple of years now and is not likely to change anytime soon. Um, and and that means lots of layering of HTML techniques. And that's that's what that's why I always start with somebody else's boilerplate email design because they have done a great job of putting in these layers of CSS styles and table attributes and font tags and like all of these things to make sure that it'll test well and reproduce pretty faithfully um, across these different platforms. 
I mean, it's even more important here to to not adopt that pixel perfect mentality, but to make sure that it renders well and usably across all these devices. And also a real important point is that to keep the initial layouts simple in their yes. construct. You know, uh, if people are really trying to get multi-column, which are okay, but lots of multi-columns and things being positioned in the middle and the top, and that, you know, the more complex you get with the layout, the more difficult it will get to deliver this, just like on a web page. Yeah, frankly, or right? like things as simple as <laughs> background images. Yeah, Back exactly. It's going to be notoriously difficult to achieve reliably in Outlook. Right. So, you know, there's there's a lot of things that, that just don't work from one platform to the other. So it pays to start with these templates and test early and often using services like um, Litmus. And I, I think BrowserStack may have a, an email testing thing. But um, some of the services do too. Campaign Monitor will give you a bunch of different screenshots of your rendered email. And I think MailChimp has something like that, too. Yeah, I was actually going to mention MailChimp's tool um, prior when Steve was talking about testing emails and, and checking different mail clients. Um, they have a really good tool that'll uh, that'll do uh, a check-in in a bunch of different um, environments and give you screenshots um, so you can see what what's going on, how, how it's working. And in the end, right, in the end, when you're talking about email notifications, you're truly talking about being able to reach people and get them to get to the content. So the simpler, as long as you're following some general branding guidelines that support the company, the simpler you can make these emails, the more success you're going to have overall. Yeah. yeah, and that's, I mean, I think sort of coming back to, you know, that, like, Sending HTML email in the first place allows you to bring a greater level of design, which should then, in theory, be helping you communicate more effectively and make more visual calls to action and, and things like that. And and um, the first thing you've got to do is get them to open the email because, you know, how many times do we look at a list of messages on our smartphone and we're making a judgment based on whether or not we delete this message instantly based on the first 50 letters in the subject line and who it's coming from. Mm -hmm. And so if we don't find that compelling, then we're not going to tap on the message and open it. And then once it opens, we need to be able to read it, and it needs to be presenting something clearly that says, oh, this is worth, this is worth the time. This is worth the effort to actually finish reading it, take some action with it, um, and, and do something. And, and HTML will have help with the second half of that but it won't help getting people to open it in the first place. You know, it, it maybe could be a really interesting topic later down the road to have someone come on who does, uh, specializes in email campaigns and subject line testing and that kind of stuff. Uh, maybe, maybe it's more of a marketing show at some point, uh, but um, some of the customers I was referencing earlier when we set up these emails, uh, they'll send out, you know, one million emails that have this subject line on it, another set of emails that have this subject line on it, um, and they do these testing on every time they send these emails out, and they tweak one, two words or characters in between these things every month. Um, and a single fraction of a percentage point, a, 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 a 0.5 percentage point, when you're sending out 5 million emails, could make a significant difference in business. Yeah, no kidding. And, and we're sort of getting off track here, but um, let's talk about... Um, going back to our, our list for the day, we haven't really touched on a module called Simple News, which I think touches on some of the things that we've been uh, getting yeah. at in terms of not simple notifications. Um, we've, we've used that extensively at Schoolyard and are using it still now um, to help people create newsletter content that lives on the website but then is assembled into a newsletter that gets sent out um, to people from the site with a certain amount of analytics built in that um, that makes it easy for them to, to build the newsletter, send it to a list of people that are uh, like a subscription list that's built into their website. They're all authenticated users and um, it's an entirely sort of self-contained way of doing this without requiring they subscribe to an external service. 
So, so Jason, you're saying that with simple news in my mail and your server's basic SMTP functionality, you could essentially have a service like um, Mailchimp or Constant Contact um, on your yeah. on your website. Um, yep. Again, going back to our previous conversation, depending on volume. Sure, sure, and and. I mean, I can tell you that they have throttles on it so that it will send only so many emails per cron run. So you can send two or 300 messages per run, and if you have cron running every 15 minutes, then it'll get your list out in a few hours. And so we've done that with subscription lists of a couple thousand without having any impact on the server at all. And, um, you know, if you're smart about caching, then the generation of those emails doesn't produce too big a load. Um, so we've, we've had pretty good luck with that, and it's, it's been a highly utilized feature so that people know that they can go create a newsletter issue and then go create articles and attach them, and then it builds up using a couple of embedded views and sends the message out, and, um, and then it's also automatically archived on the website. And that's, that's the one thing that's missing from all of these services is actually having the content connected to and living on your website. Mm. Uh, another quick tip here is, and I'm not sure if you're actually doing this, but if you're, if you're batching uh, emails or, or feeds or things that are intensive, if you use the system cron to run the Drupal cron, you'll not see any impact either, um, generally. Uh, if you if you if you run the Drupal cron you know through the UI and somebody visits the page and are authenticated, they'll still get get that extremely long page load. But if you're right. running it through the system, nobody will ever see that. Right, I get I got two questions on the last things that was said in the last thirty seconds. <laughs> uh, something I want to highlight from Jason first, which is an important point that I think just went by too quick, is that <laughs> if you're generating some of the content from your site directly, you can bring people back to the website to read the content. Right. Right. It's a really important point. Yeah. Contra contrasting some of the services we're going to talk about in a minute, which are MailChimp and Constant Contact, where that content does not reside on your website. So you don't get the benefits of bringing people back necessarily to your well, domain name. Well, but but you can. It just depends on how you want to set things up. So so right. here's the scenario. You've got an issue and you've got five articles or posts that you want to go into this newsletter. And in that, that newsletter format is either going to send out those five stories in their entirety on that one email or mm -hmm. it's going to send out teasers and link back to the full article. Now, a lot of people are trying to use this as a way to drive greater engagement on their website itself, so they want to send a shorter email and then give people the invitation to come back, and that also helps you measure click rates and, and all that sort of thing. Um, so in that case, it's not really any different if you go and build a newsletter in Campaign Monitor or MailChimp or Constant Contact, and you have this first paragraph of text and a link, and that link is going back to content on your website. Well, but now you've got to create that content twice. And that's what led us, again, back to liking the Simple News solution, is that we're, like, they only do things one time. They go to one interface, they create that content, they send it, and off it goes. And... Um, and it's not perfect. We really spent a lot of time working with the issues that we had. Um, this was mostly with Drupal 6. We're now going through redeveloping one of those in Drupal 7. Um, so there are fewer issues now, but it was challenging to get it working really smoothly, but it did work, and it has logged tens of thousands of messages going out without ever requiring any attention, and the, the customer uses it every week. Jason, so question question for you. Um, one of the 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 benefits to using a service um, like Mailchimp or Constant Contact is link um, tracking. Mm -hmm. If you're using something like Simple News, is there some sort of add-on for Google Analytics, or yep. is there some way to track your clicks from your emails? Yeah, you can um, you can there's an add-on module for Simple News and Google Analytics to embed the tracking there. Um, one of the things that I found to be an issue previously that I'm not sure is still the case um, is that I had added in a short URL um, module as well, and um, 
it it added a huge amount of system overhead because every link was being turned into a short URL and it was checking that table every single time. So it ended up with literally hundreds of thousands of records in there, and um, it was incredibly inefficient. And I had to turn it off. So you do want to be careful. Like you do get better analytics using the service, and you have less load on your server, which I think is really important. And that's actually what led us to start looking more at the Mailchimp module because the Mailchimp module will allow you to do a very similar thing as Simple News to create content on your website and include it in a newsletter that gets sent out as your Mailchimp newsletter. So we're okay. still working through it, but I like it. I like it a lot. So I want, I want to pause right there and get back to my second question a few minutes ago. And Nick is probably the one that might... Everyone might have the insight in this. I just feel like this is a Nick question. It feels like to me, based on my experience, that an SMTP call is a very expensive thing on a server. The, like when you said before that, you know, if you make the cron job not linked to user interaction, it still feels like to me, if I've got 300 emails or 1,000 emails going out there in one cron job, that I feel that. Even if it's not a user initiating it, I still feel that on the server. And I've always sort of felt like SMTP feels like it's very expensive. I don't know that it is. It's just sort of my feeling. Um, yeah, either way, you'll feel it less if the system's running the cron rather yeah. than okay. um, the Apache process. It's, it's, Steve, it is a multi-step handshake that goes on every time mm -hmm. you make that connection. So, you know, I think it is overhead, but that's also coupled with the message being assembled. And, and so that, I think, is actually the greater challenge, is that you're coupling that along with a view or, or several views that are assembling that message and sending it out. And that's where making sure that you're caching those views in an appropriate way so that you can cache the content but still personalize the email mm -hmm. and still have that go out successfully. Um, that requires uh, you know a fair amount of fine tuning, but but Nick's guy's right on the head with that. So if you you want to basically effectively turn off the built-in cron running, and schedule it as a system task so that it's not triggered to a user's page load. I, I think that's just a general Drupal sort of thing, isn't it? As well, I mean, yeah. that yeah. that should sort of be if any site has any reasonable amount of traffic, that's the way cron should be handled, right? Yeah, although yeah, you now you, like in Drupal seven, you had to start thinking about it because it's on by default. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. You know, I mean, poor man's cron used to be an add-on module, which I customized to get it to run more often, so that it would have less to do every time. Right. All right, so let's move on to these external services, if we have more to say about them, um, and let's start with Mailchimp. I think the Mailchimp module provides a lot of functionality. Loads. Yeah. Yes. Mailchimp. As far as Mailchimp, um, as far as external services go, Mailchimp is probably my my number one all time favorite. Um, followed closely uh, by Campaign Monitor, and I'll I'll, I'll mention that I'll mention why later on. But yeah, the Mailchimp module does offer a ton of uh, features. Um, and just to be clear on how, how MailChimp is actually working, MailChimp um, is managing your lists for you. It's managing your email templates for you. So everything that is really involved with your HTML email is being handled on the MailChimp side. The only thing that the module allows you to do within Drupal is... Um, is really uh, to get users to sign up for um, for certain lists um, and that sort of thing. It does do a little bit of list management. You can get it to do that, but I always find that it's easier just to log into Mailchimp to do your list management. Um, on the content creation side, though, John, that that it, it's actually incredibly impressive. Um, it adds a text input format, it, and it adds the ability to um, basically denote certain content types as able to be embedded in a MailChimp newsletter. And, and, and it, you know, I'm still working my way through 
getting it running successfully, but so far my early tests have been incredibly easy um, to generate these messages and send them out. So you can basically have the input format and the content stuff sort of preset to be ready to use and generate um, generate messages to go out um, through MailChimp. Um, and as far as I know, it's the only one of the services to support this level of functionality. And, and I think it's worth mentioning, it's MailChimp who supported and funded the development of these modules. So, I mean, kudos to them for their support of open source platforms. They really have put a lot of time and effort into making this stuff work. So, Jason, I clarify, I just I wanted to clarify that point. Are you using the um, MailChimp RSS to, to get the content no, into your... No, the, the MailChimp module itself allows you to um, specify different content types to be collected into a newsletter. Oh, that's interesting. That must be a, a newer feature, because I, I did not realize that it allowed you to do that. It takes a little bit of digging, but I mean, as I was reading through it, it's the reason that, that I went to go start testing it was because I could see that it was, in my mind, I think probably a, a better overall solution than using Simple News. Simple News is great if you don't want to tie it to an external account and you want it to be entirely self-contained, but it does have some of these limiting issues like um, not getting enough analytics and short URLs and, and stuff like that. Um, if you want more robust, then I think MailChimp is a better a better way to go. I mean, in theory, you never have to go to the MailChimp interface. As a site owner, um, you really could get almost everything through integration with Drupal. Hmm. So I guess we don't need to talk about anything else. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, you know, it's it's worth mentioning. Like everybody uses Constant Contact, or tons of people do. There's a module to integrate that for list stuff, yep. but not for content. Campaign the other, monitors the same issue. The other thing to note um, about Mailchimp is because they're specifically working um, in the Drupal community and building and working on the Drupal module. There are better integration points for MailChimp, I've found, than the other services, um, especially in um, e-commerce and web form integration. Um, common integration points for email sign-up are when somebody buys a product for your e-commerce store on checkout, you want the ability to, for them to have an option to sign up for your newsletter. Um, or if they're filling out a web form to register for some kind of event, um, you want them to have the ability to sign up for your newsletter. Um, that's that's where MailChimp really shines, in my opinion, because uh, they really have taken the time to make the integration points into the module, into the service, a lot better for those those other instances where it's not just a hey, sign up for our email right. list on the on the homepage or wherever. Yeah, and they, don't they also have? Um, um, a form field you can add using the web form module as well. So if you're creating a, a web form, you can sort of throw that field in there as well and specify yep. a, a mailing list to connect it to. Yep, it's a specific uh, MailChimp email field. Nice. Um, I, I believe you can like set it up even on like a site registration that when someone registers for the website, they can check a box that says also send me sign me up for the email list. Nice. Yeah, it has a lot of different integration points that really yeah. make sense yeah. and I not mean, to not to not to diss constant contact but I've, I've had to do the same thing with their with their service and it has not been as easy um, to integrate I, I think it illustrates really a philosophy at the heart of Drupal and especially where Drupal is going with Drupal 8 is being a player in a larger environment and not trying to own everything use the right tools for the right job and integrate with them smoothly and MailChimp is really kind of a perfect example of that. Like, that is a platform meant for generating and sending email. Drupal is not. It can be used that way, but that's not what it was meant to do in the first place. So, in my mind, better to integrate and use the right tool for the right job. Another, so another, I was yeah, just going to say, for those, for those people who are just starting, those developers who are working with customers who are just starting to think about HTML emails and communicating in a proactive way. Um, a, gr a great way to just start is to 
sign up for MailChimp. Free and have, accounts. And have all of the content generated on the MailChimp side and just have people sign up for it on the website. It's really an it's easy to do from a development side to get people to sign up yep. and get automatically added to the list. And it's an easy way to get a customer to use the MailChimp templating tools to generate their content and keep yep. it out of the website initially. Um, it's, 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 a, it's a really good way to start. That's a great point, Steve. It really is one of the things that I love about you know these third-party services and, and MailChimp in particular is that you're right. You can set up a template and show your client how to edit, set up editable regions, and your client can go in and edit only the regions that you've specified in their template to send out their own emails. Um, these services also have a great ability to keep you honest. Um, a lot of times, people want to just take some email list that they've had from their old website and drop it into. Um, drop it into uh, one of these systems and just blanket email everybody on the list. And um, a lot of these services are actually um, kind of standing up and saying, hey, did you get permission from these people to email them? Did they opt into these emails? Um, and it's one of their criteria for um, setting up the account. So they, they help you in that way, too, to kind of keep you honest and make sure that you're, you're actually sending emails to people that really want to get them and that you're going to avoid... Um, being on one of those spam lists. Okay, so do we, do, is there anything else we want to say about Constant Contact? We've sort of just uh, laid down for MailChimp <laughs> and basically told everyone listening, listen, if you, if, if you need to start, start with MailChimp. But I do think Constant Contact was part of probably the industry leader here yeah. uh, at, at some point. I'm going to go out on a limb and say that Constant Contact is really like the Microsoft of um, email email services. Wow. I'm going to let, every, I'm going to let everybody infer for themselves. How, <laughs> Talk know, about taunting the dragon, John. Jeez. What that means. Hey, you know, some people love using a PC, you know, we are, or, a, or a Windows-based PC, I should say. We can, yeah, we can I mean, look I, at Nick's direction for that. <laughs> I have to say, um, personally, I'm I'm a bigger fan of Mailchimp. I think that they have um, better service. They, you know, they they support the open source community. They have better pricing models. Um, but I do say I, I have several clients who started with Mailchimp and then very quickly switched to Constant Contact. Um, I, you know, for whatever reason, many clients find the interface of um, constant contact easier to use. The fact that the support answers so much quicker, easier, you know, better, even though it's more expensive. Um, you know, I do in the constant contact module constantly gives errors every single time it updates or Drupal updates. You're getting errors or notices. I'm I'm not a huge fan of how it integrates with Drupal. Um, feels very clunky and kludgy, just like the service. But as I said, many Many clients, I find, um, do prefer Constant Contact, so it's still a leader. I haven't figured out the reason, but there definitely is a reason. <laughs> well, I, I, you know, Nick, I actually, I think um, a lot of people use it because that's what they started with, because like we said, that, that was the first one in the space, and there's a familiarity. And when people, it's like when you sit down and ask people if they like using Word, they say, sure, it's great. I, I, I have no issues whatsoever. And then you watch them, and it's one workaround after another. And it's kind of painful for you to watch as an outsider, but they've learned those workarounds, and that's familiar. So they're familiar with what that interface is. doesn't matter if it's more or less capable, but that's, um, yeah. you know, that's, that's a factor. It's, you know, and um, MailChimp and Campaign Monitor both um, are fabulously easy to use, and they're far easier for us to work with as developers, and the pricing is great, but if it's not the first thing that they've tried, they may feel like it's foreign. I mean, the, the, the truth is you have to think less using MailChimp and Campaign Monitor than you do Constant Contact, but if that's the way they've been trained to think, then that's what they will say and feel is easier. So what do we have to say about Campaign Monitor? We've mentioned it a couple of times here. Is there any 
Any campaign monitor or any other tools that we just wanted to mention here in terms of third party? Yeah, uh, I, uh, services. Campaign, campaign monitor is very much like Mailchimp. Um, the one big difference that I that I've seen is that campaign monitor offers a, a great reseller program, um, where to the best of my knowledge, Mailchimp does does not. Um, basically, a campaign campaign monitor allows you to set up an account. And then from that account, you can manage your clients as kind of sub-accounts. And you can um, set up pricing for them based on, um, you know, how much they send and that sort of thing. So an example would be if you wanted to get, you know, you wanted to offer this to, as a service for them for free but charge them a penny per send, you can upcharge campaign monitors fees for an additional penny, which you would get to keep um, after Campaign Monitor takes their piece. Um, and it really is a great way for you to kind of enhance your brand. Um, you can brand the, the interface so it has your, your company's branding and, and all that stuff. Um, and you can, you can set up billing so they get charged directly through Campaign Monitor or they get charged through you. Um, so there are a lot of options in there. So it's, it's very much a... Uh, you know, a, a solution for somebody that's running a shop and wants to offer email services to their clients. That's fantastic. I wish Google Apps had that kind of um, opportunity. Another um, another thing worth mentioning is, um, I mean, I know I mentioned it in passing, but the, the way to develop templates for Campaign Monitor is the easiest of all of them that I've tried. Um, they've got great sample stuff to work with. They're also in the midst of rolling out uh, or at least they were testing it and and showing it off when I was at Future Insights in Las Vegas uh, last month. Um, a really fantastic new email builder that will allow you to the, your customer, the the whoever is creating the email, to make um, to build a responsive email through their platform with incredible ease. So in terms of content creation and the robustness of it, um, that tool is going to be really pretty fantastic. So we've talked about a number of tools with HTML email, some strategy. Is there anything left that we want to say before we move on to our module of the week? Um, one other thing I want to mention um, is the makers of Zurb Foundation, um, well, Zurb is actually the name of the organization, have a set of responsive email tools and templates that you can use as well. I'll have to go look up the, the link and we'll add that to the show notes. But um, if you are creating the templates for your messages, then this could be a really fantastic place to start um, to, to get a really robust framework to use to create the HTML and, um, uh, and CSS for, for your emails to go out. Great. So if you could include that in the show notes, I have also already included the tutorial I found online. Uh, that was an HTML. If you need to hand code some HTML emails, it's a great way to understand what the issues are with HTML emails. And I posted a uh, a tutorial into the show notes for that as well. So if we add the Zurb, anyone who wants to get down and dirty here, <laughs> I with mean, HTML yeah. emails, <laughs> uh, we've given we've given them all they need. So that's good. Right, let's move on to the module of the week, table field. Oh man, this one uh, this one was was revolutionary to me. Uh, I recently um, was working on a project, and a client needed um, they were selling products online, and they needed a um, a table of product specs, uh, basically a uh, two column table with probably about 12 rows in it, and uh, I was trying to figure out the best way to do this in Drupal, and I, I thinking to myself, well, I can give them a, a WYSIWYG field with, uh, you know, the table tools, and they can just build their own table, um, but, you know, that's not as controlled as I would like, and, and sometimes that can be hard for clients to kind of wrap their head around. So I did a little searching, and I, and I stumbled across the table field. Um, and what this module essentially does is create a field type that you can add to your content types that will allow 
the editor to add tabular data to the content type. And then it presents it out as just a basic Drupal table that you can theme any way that you need to. That's pretty awesome. Yeah, uh, I, I, it is pretty awesome. Yeah, it's pretty. It's pretty cool. It lets you change the rows and change the columns. I was using it on a project for a while. I found, I found it inter interacts poorly with field collection, um, but that's more because you end up with so many entities on on an edit page, but when you have when you have the need of just one or two tables, it's it's extremely extremely useful. I found it to be very helpful. I like the idea that you can give the client the ability to just upload a CSV file rather than, than have to, to to like put stuff in by hand. That's pretty cool. Yeah, and you can actually tune in next week for the module of the week and I'll tell you how I output that in uh, another table in a very <laughs> very interesting way. We 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 are rocking it like it's 1997. Yeah, All the table like... love. Is this responsive? Well, it that, can be. That's yet to be determined. Okay. Well, yeah, it may I, take some work, but you can make tables responsive. There's a bunch I, of different yeah. Things. Yeah, I yeah. Think yeah. It was, I think I've it done it as well. I'm just I'm just curious. Is I I mean like sort of out of the box? Are they thinking about that? I think in my initial testing it was pretty close. Um, like I said, I had for a couple of pro I had abandoned it for other reasons, but um, it was pretty clean. It didn't add tons of stuff. Also gives the uh, the user the ability to select how many tables, uh, how many columns and rows, right there in the content type and re and rebuild the the table. To, to support that, so that's that's nice as well. It's not set to a fixed height and height and width. Well, you can also restrict that, I think, too. I think you can yep. say you this can, is the yeah. max that it can have is five rows or six columns or whatever. Yeah, you can lock it down. They're pretty good permission set as well. Great. Cool. Okay, so let's uh, let's wrap this thing up. What do we have coming up that we want to make announcements for? <laughs> Everything. It might be a little late. Yeah, we have Design for Drupal, which is this week in two days. Yep. Uh, August 1st through 3rd in Boston. Uh, you can go to designfordrupal.org and uh, get more information about that. Coming up in September, we have the Nerd Summit, September 12th through the 14th. Um, we have the Connecticut Drupal Camp, which I don't. we don't have in our show notes. Can someone look that up quick? The dates. I'm I'm guessing the last weekend of August, but yeah, I I feel like that the 23rd was coming to mind, but um, uh, I'm not sure see. if that's the most recent date. The site is not updated yet. 23rd. Uh, 20 23rd is that it? Okay. Yeah, yeah. So the 23rd, and you know, it's interesting because we're located in New England, so we're always making announcements that are based where we're located. And we, uh, I know we have listeners that are everywhere, and sorry, we can't help it. These are the things that we're going to. So uh, we apologize for that. So uh, it's making me wonder if we should continue making announcements um, or we should make it more globally, something for us to think about in the future. Uh, we also have the New England Drupal Camp on November 1st. So well, things that I we'll be attending and participating in. We we should uh, we should invite our listeners to let us know about events that you would like us to talk about. How about that? Uh, that could be a way to do it. So if you if you send if you send send us an email, send us a, a tweet, send us something and say, Hey, talk about our event. We will well, as long as it's Drupal related, we, we will <laughs> include it in our in our list of upcoming events. How's that? You know, it, it's felt like to me in the past the one of the better resources online for Drupal events comes from Build a Module. Yeah, they've got a great yeah. calendar. They they keep their calendar updated with everything that's there, and and uh, if you submit something to them, they'll have it up in 24 hours. That's awesome. So, uh, yeah, so check that out if you need to. Um, cool. So Jason, where can people find you online or contact you if they want to? 
You can find me online at Jay Pomentel, pretty much everywhere. Uh, you can find work at hwdesignco.com. And I have um, all of my edits and artwork in for responsive typography from O'Reilly. So if you're interested in finding out more about that, you can go to responsivetypographybook.com. And Jason, it took me way too long to do this, but I purchased my copy last week. So. <laughs> Uh, well, then I, you actually should have gotten the email uh, the last couple of days to, that has the early release of the, the latest draft that has all of my edits and new artwork in there. Uh, that's Thanks interesting because I don't remember seeing that email. I uh, should have. I think the email went out two days ago, but um, yeah, you can. Uh, I just got the email with the production schedule, um, so I'll, I'll be getting uh, different different rounds of edits from the production editor and that sort of thing, but it's it's tantalizingly close, and I, it sounds like I will have hard copies sometime in September. I'm, I'm holding out for my personally signed hard copy. Oh. I'll sign it for you. So I think he's saying he's not going to give you any money, is what I, I think he's saying. I think so. I think that is it. <laughs> All right, so... Um... John, where can people find you? You can find me on uh, most social networks at John Picozzi and uh, always on at umfink.com. You can also find me at uh, our, our table at Design for Drupal uh, Friday, Saturday, and uh, Friday and Saturday. Yeah. Awesome. Great. And Nick, how about you? You can find me at Nick's Van and this, the first two days of Design for Drupal. Uh, at Design for Drupal. Looking forward to meeting some people. Um, looking forward to a couple of talks from people here on the show as well um, and just uh, learning more about Drupal. Awesome. I'm looking forward to being face-to-face -face with all you guys over the weekend, which we don't get to do very often. So um, everyone have a good week, and we will talk. I'm Stephen Cross at Stephen with a PH Cross on Twitter or parallaxinfotech.com, and uh, I guess we'll see everybody in two days. All right. See you then. Take care, guys. Bye. Sounds good.